Okay, thank you very much, uh, Marc. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here at Collège de France, and uh, so I want to thank you again in particular for uh, the invitation. So in this talk, I will be touching upon some work the, that I have been doing over the last years, uh, starting in 2007 until last year, with a um, variety of, of collaborators that I enumerated here, Geoffrey Comper, Tom Hartman, Diego Hoffman, Zwickel, uh, Ankita Garwal, Alejandra Castro, Luca Ciambelli, Antoine Sommerhausen, and I will also report on some work in progress with uh, my grad student Ankita Garwal, who is also in Amsterdam, uh, Alejandra Castro in Amsterdam, and Beatrix Millman, who is a postdoc at McGill. So let me start by setting the stage and what is the broad context of this talk. So the broad context is that it is known since the 70s that black holes um, behave like thermal systems. So black holes, they have a temperature. Black holes have an entropy that is given by one quarter in Planck unit and one quarter of their horizon uh, area, and they satisfy, the, they satisfy the laws of black hole mechanics. And these, lo these laws of black hole mechanics, they bear uh, striking resemblances, of course, with the laws of thermodynamics. Laws of black hole. So people uh, contributing to this work in the 70s include Bekenstein, Hawking, Bardeen, Carter, and, and, and others. So the laws of black hole mechanics say that dm is tds plus some other term. So of course, the, the fact that, um, that black holes uh, have an entropy, seem to have an entropy, um, well, that raised uh, the longstanding question of identifying the, the microstates of that, that, that entropy. So the, the question is, so can we give a microscopic uh, account a la Boltzmann of the macroscopic entropy that black holes seems to ha seem to have. So the question. I think I lost my <clears throat> my microphone. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. So S is a log of some number of microstates. It's K. So what is what are these microstates? So of course, it's, uh, it's interesting actually to appreciate that this number of microstates is actually huge. So for um, a stellar mass black hole, so this number is about 10 to the 10 to the 77. So for Sagittarius A star, so the black hole at the center of our galaxy of which we just saw a picture uh, a couple of weeks ago, this is about 10 to the 10 to the 92. So of course, these are, these are really huge numbers. And well, of course, it's really hard to appreciate what this means. But to give you an idea, um, if you take all the Google data bank, all the information contained in the Google data bank, this would fit in a black hole that is about the size of a trillionth of a trillionth of a millimeter. Okay? So our um, Google, say, black hole, that's about 10 to the minus 24 millimeter. And that black hole would about weigh like half a kilo. So, okay. so if you want to get rid of Google, it's really easy. It's easy to do. So OK, so here's the plan of the talk. So our progress in the understanding of uh, black hole microstates and black hole entry, the black hole entropy problem uh, has been tightly knit, actually, to a field. And that field is the field of three-dimensional gravity. And that, that field itself, as, man, as Mark actually mentioned uh, like briefly in his talk, 3D gravity is itself deeply connected with two-dimensional conformal symmetry. So um, what I will do in this talk, I will just I make, to make connections, to make connections with Mark lecture, I will start by reviewing some aspects of 3D gravity, how conformal symmetry emerges there, and how it can be relevant to understand black holes first in three dimensions, but also to see how this conformal symmetry can be used to understand black holes in higher dimensions. Okay, then what I will do after is that I will review some arguments. So that, that's going to be the, the three first sections. And I will do, what I will do afterwards is to review arguments uh, that have appeared over the years that actually different kinds of symmetries could be relevant to, um, to the problem, to, to understand black hole microstates.
So this will lead us to consider classes of, uh, of black holes and of solutions that actually depart from uh, the, the BTC black holes that, that Mark uh, was mentioning earlier. So this will lead us to spaces that deform ADS3 that, that seem to be like relevant for curved black holes that are called warped ADS3 spaces. So we'll analyze their symmetries and see that these symmetries will naturally lead to the definition of new types of field theories that actually bear some similarities with two-dimensional conformal field theories in the sense that they, they have like really wonderful properties. So they are, they are potentially solvable, they have modular properties, you can compute the density of states, but they are somehow really different. However, since, even though their structure is really different, sometimes you have, a lot, you have observables that are really hard to distinguish between warp CFT observables and CFT observables. So sometimes a warp CFT can disguise itself in a CFT. So sometimes we can, we can be confused. So what I'll try to do in the last part of the talk, which is ongoing work, is to set up a regime that's called the, the near-extremal regime that will hopefully allow us to discriminate between warp CFTs and CFTs. I will try to see if there are quantities that we can, like, for example, find in the boat that will allow us to, de to determine if we indeed have a CFT description or warp CFT description or neither of these. Okay, um, great. So let's get started then. So let me review, to, to, so let me review 3D gravity. So three-dimensional gravity, Einstein-Hilbert gravity is just given by so the following action. And we'll focus on a negative cosmological constant here. And uh, as Mark mentioned, well, the vacuum state of ADS2 gravity is given by um, the ADS3 metric. So most of the time, I will just set L equal to 1, but sometimes I will like reinstate it. So we have the ADS3 metric. That's the vacuum state in the sense that it has maximal isometries, as Mark was mentioning, SO2, 2 isometries, or SL2R times SL2R. So this is the ADS3, the ADS3 metric. So one among the many important contributions to, Mar uh, to, to, uh, well, to gravity of Mark um, has been precisely in the field of three-dimensional gravity. Because um, so his insights actually on three-dimensional gravity are at least twofold. So one, um, by, by studying the symmetries of ADS3 gravity, he, his results with, 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 uh, with, with Brown can, are, are now seen as a precursor of the ADS-CFT correspondence. So for one thing, so we'll, we'll review this in a second. And for another thing, um, well, what he has been able to, to, to do, in, in, in particular in the study of the three-dimensional black hole, is to provide an extremely useful toy model that is used in many instances to address various questions related to black hole physics, but in a simplified setting. So BTZ was around. 92 and 93. So what was done in this paper by Braun and Eno in 86 was to identify a phase space of ADS3 gravity. So phase space, for here I, I will be using interchangeably the word phase space and configuration space, but what they figured out is a set of boundary conditions, a fall off conditions on a metric, that defines the set of metrics that you would consider, for example, in a path integral um, in, in gravity. So, Braun et Noe, so determined a phase space for ADS3 gravity plus determined Uh, determine its asymptotic symmetries. So the asymptotic symmetries, so what I mean by phase space here that is specified by, by certain fall off conditions. So for example, you would only consider metrics that fall off at infinity like minus r squared plus big O of one as r goes to infinity and similar conditions on the other components of the metric like actually Mark uh, did a couple a couple minutes ago in his lecture. So 
They determine the phase space for ADS3 gravity, so uh, boundary conditions, and determine the asymptotic symmetry. So the asymptotic symmetries are the set of non-trivial diffeomorphism that preserve these boundary conditions. So non-trivial diffeomorphism, that means that they preserve the boundary conditions, but they are associated with non-trivial charges, non-zero non charges. And what actually they, what, what they, what they found, and determine is asymptotic symmetry. So these asymptotic symmetries, the, well, the striking observation is that these asymptotic symmetries, of course, they form some algebra. So Mark mentioned that they form this SO2,2 algebra, but that in, ge well, in general, they, 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 there is a much bigger symmetry. And actually, this much bigger symmetry is the 2D conformal algebra. So associated with asymptotic symmetries, you have asymptotic charges, and these charges generate through their Poisson bracket an algebra isomorphic to the, to the algebra of symmetries up to central charges. And this is what happens. What they found is that the 2D conformal algebra, which is given by the famous Virasoro algebra. And the pretty fascinating and maybe surprising result, well, actually, I don't know if it was surprising to you back then, the fact that you have a non-trivial central extension. But here, C is given in terms of the ADS radius and, the, and, the, the, and Newton's constant. And this is called the Brown and central charge. OK, so what is this telling us? So well, this is telling us that we have uh, that ADS tree gravity has a classical phase space that is endowed with a symmetry. And that symmetry is a 2D conformal symmetry. So this suggests that if you would quantize the theory, well, upon quantization, when you have a classical symmetry acting in a phase space, when you quantize a system, you expect that states will form representation of the symmetry algebra. So that suggests that quantum gravity, whatever this means in ADS3, is a two-dimensional CFT. Two-dimensional CFT is a filtery where uh, fields where states transforms, transform in representations of the 2D conformal group. OK. Um, now, interestingly, so that, that's one first observation. So what's interesting about the second one is that the phase space, the Brown and O phase space, contains black holes. And these are the BTZ black holes. So, so Mark wrote the metric of the BTC black hole, but let me just like write the metric of um, uh, maybe the simplest non-rotating BTC black hole. So that's uh, the non-rotating BTC where M goes like R plus squared and J equals zero. So what's interesting is that so these black holes really are the lower dimensional version of the curved black holes, and they have more or less the same properties. In particular, they have an entropy that is given by one quarter of the area of their horizon. This is 2 pi r plus over 4g. This r plus actually is a function of m and j in general. So that's the Bekenstein-Hawking Bekenstein entropy of the black hole. So no, if we take at phase this relation with, um, with two-dimensional CFTs, well, two-dimensional CFTs are really powerful theories. Or the symmetries of 2D CFTs are really powerful. And in particular, 2D CFTs have a Cardi formula, what is called the Cardi formula. So the Cardi formula, so CFT Cardi formula. So the Cardi formula modulo certain assumptions on the two-dimensional CFT, some really general assumptions on 2D CFTs, allows to compute the asymptotic growth of states. Okay, so for example, the microcanonical uh, entropy um, and of a 2D CFT. So if you want to compute, know the entropy, the number of states with fixed uh, left and right moving uh, so E left and E right are just so the zero modes of the of the Virasoro generators, and they are actually related to L M plus minus J. 
if, if you match this to the, to the BTZ parameters. If you compare the Cardi formula for a 2D CFT to the entropy, to the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the 2D black hole, well, you find that they are actually equal. So this means that actually you are able that the Bekenstein Hawking entropy uh, of, a, of a BTZ black hole in 3D gravity is exactly the, the entropy of, uh, let's say, a hot fluid of interacting particles in a two-dimensional CFT. Okay, so there are some things you can say. Well, the Cardi formula only applies in a certain regime, which is a regime of high temperature. And actually, well, this formula seems to be valid like for even lower temperature, but this is related possibly to the, to the really specific nature of the two-dimensional CFT, which should have a sparse spectrum which extends the range of the Cardi formula. Okay, wait, we can talk about it a bit later. But of course, so this matching that was done by Strominger in 97 between the BTZ entropy and that of a two-dimensional CFT, well, just reinforced this idea that uh, ADS3 gravity and, and two-dimensional CFTs were tightly connected. Okay, um, good. So this brings us already to the third point of our talk. Oh yeah, so yeah, just one, one thing. Uh, actually, so this, so here we saw that so, uh, so 2D CFTs are related to 3D black holes. Actually, this analysis also generalizes to black holes in higher dimensions that have an ADS3 near horizon geometry. So if you take a five, there are, there are certain five dimensional, five dimensional black holes, uh, BPS black holes in N equals four eight supergravity. And when these, when these black holes are BPS, uh, they're extreme, so their they're near horizon geometry contains an, an ADS3 factor. And then the whole, the whole reasoning here goes through where the large diffeomorphism, they don't act on, on the asymptotic boundary of the full geometry, but they don't act at the boundary of, uh, of the near horizon geometry. So, so this applies to, this generalizes to higher D black holes with ADS3 times something like S3 near horizon geometry and though the Braun and Wuhan analysis applies um, to the near horizon region. Okay. Well, this is nice, but actually this connection between conformal symmetry and, um, and black hole entropy um, has, be, has, been, has been generalized in various directions in the last 10 or 15 years. And there were various hints that 2D conformal symmetry was actually not confined to ADS3 spaces or to spaces with an ADS3 near horizon geometry, but that the relevance of 2D conformal symmetry could be more general. So I will review, uh, so there's like a couple evidences. So here, I'm not gonna mention them all, and I will just mention um, three evidences that have appeared over the years that 2D conformal symmetry could also be relevant for higher dimensional black holes. In particular, let me focus on the three plus one dimensions, three plus one dimensional curved black hole. So the first, um, the first evidence for this uh, came about um, oops, so came about like oh, almost 15 years uh, ago in the form of the Kerr CFT correspondence. Paper by uh, Guica, Song, Hartman, Strominger. So, Kerr black holes, they have, so extreme Kerr black holes, extreme Kerr black holes. So, they have um, J, which is M squared over G. 
So these black holes, they have a near horizon geometry that is somehow a little bit similar to the near horizon geometry that you would find in supersymmetric black holes. But no, the ADS3 times S3 geometry is replaced by another geometry that I will come back to uh, in, a, in a minute. But in that case, ADS3 times S3 well, is actually replaced by a geometry that's called the neck geometry. I will come to it. I'll write it explicitly in a, in a minute. So what, what was done in this paper is that, well, the, um, what was done by, by these people in the Kerr CFT correspondence is that they wrote boundary conditions for the neck geometry. Um, in particular, well, so they wrote boundary conditions including the neck geometry. And instead of finding two copies of a Virazoro algebra, what they find is only one copy of a Virazoro algebra. So the asymptotic symmetry group of neck or more precisely, of boundary conditions, including NEC, uh, was found to be just one copy of the Razoro algebra, a single one, and the central charge was evaluated to be 12J. Applying the Cardi formula with that value of the central charge just showed that the, the entropy of, of extremal curve matched the Cardi formula. A bit the same way that it was done for BTZ or for higher dimensions black hole with uh, ADS3 near horizon geometry. So that's one, one evidence. Somehow, the near horizon geometry of Kerr has a conformal symmetry, was a, a chiral conformal symmetry, and this allows to, to account for the, BT, for, the, sorry, for, the, for the extremal Kerr geometry. Question? Yes? Why, why do you call it a central charge if it depends on J? I think it's okay that central charge depends on the charge. In higher dimensions, this is also, also what happens. But is it central? Um, so, yeah. So J, J is fixed in these boundary conditions, actually. So J is not allowed to vary. And this is more like in higher dimensional examples where you would have that C is. So here, what maybe what you get some inspiration from string theory where the charge, you would like imagine that this comes from a number of, of brains. For example, in higher dimension, you would have that C is like 6Q1, Q5. It's a little bit that, that kind of interpretation, but yeah. So it's, it's, it's really fixed from the outside, it's not allowed to vary. But yes. 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 And now your criticism is that this J is also generated by some. It is a function of the dynamical variable. It's a function of the dynamical yeah. variable. Yeah. The curvature. But yeah, but, in, but their boundary conditions are really, really special. And they fix this. So M is also fixed? Yeah. yeah. M is fixed to be, to be J, M squared is J. Yes. Something you have boundary conditions, you have generators. It's, it's, it's exactly the same. Um, yes. OK, so that's a first evidence. A second evidence came from what is called the hidden conformal symmetries. That was, that was done by Castro, Maloney, and Strominger. And that's something. Um, okay, there it was shown. So there they considered generic Kerr black hole, a generic Kerr black hole. And there it was shown that even though the near horizon geometry of a generic Kerr black hole might not exhibit conformal symmetry, well, the solution space of fields propagating on a curl black hole, like perturbations of the curl black hole, in a certain regime, exhibit conformal symmetry. Okay? So what they did there is like they, they took um, so the wave equation for a, a field on curl, for a, a scalar field on curl, and so you, you, can, you can separate uh, the wave equation in Uh, so, so the way so the wave equation separates. That's, that's the famous uh, thing about the curve, the curve wave, the, the 
the, the curve wave equation. And if you consider a certain regime, which is the regime of very long wavelengths, so you consider perturbations whose wavelength is much bigger than black hole horizon. So that's, that means that you have this condition, and you also, also consider like what is called a near, a near region. Um, well, then you can show that the, 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 well, the radial equation for R uh, just simplifies into a hypergeometric function. Okay? And hypergeometric functions that are known to form representations of SL2 R times R. So here, this, the, well, the modes, the, so this field, the solution to that equation in that limit will form representations of the global conformal group. More precisely, what you can show is that um, the radial wave equation can be written as something like this. Uh, maybe one, like so. So, so, the, spherical, so the, 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 the spherical part here will reduce the Laplacian on the sphere in that limit. So we'll just have like spherical harmonics. So you have a separation uh, constant between two equations, which is in that limit with this, so with the spherical harmonics. And um, so H, this is, this is a Casimir for SL2R. So this is just expressed, oh sorry, H squared. So H squared is just like, uh, if you will, it's gonna be like eta AB, H I, uh, H A, H B where H A and H B are vector fields satisfying the SL two R algebra. Okay, and this is um, this is what the what the radial wave equation will will collapse to in that in that regime. Okay, so that's the second evidence, and then we have the third evidence. That's maybe. Um, I think this was done for like all possible spins, and, and I think it, fermions, fermion, fermion, so I couldn't like refer to a, to a paper, but it was done for like photons, gravitons, and the, but I, I guess it has been done for fermions as well, yeah, I, I think. Um, so there is a third evidence that may be more controversial and maybe more speculative, but let me still like mention it, and it's related to what is called near horizon near horizon symmetries of generic Kerr, which I will refer to HHPS. So this was done by uh, Hawking. So Heiko, sorry. Heiko, Hawking, Perry. So that's... Uh, 18 something, that's actually uh, Stephen Hawking's last paper um, uh, well, on the archive. And, and, and. So what, what was done in that paper, actually, so, so there they took a generic Kerr black hole and looked at the geometry around, uh, well, the bifurcation horizon, close to the horizon of the, of the, uh, uh, of the generic Kerr black hole. And what they did is that they devised uh, symmetry, well, vector fields acting on the uh, acting on the near horizon geometry. The way they devise these vector fields is a bit obscure. They just like wrote two sets of generators that were satisfying a Virasoro algebra. So this Virasoro algebra looks like uh, so. So the generators they look something like like this. Minus so where so this W plus minus and Y so um, if you if you look at a curved black hole in Boyle increased coordinates um, this is just a, a change of coordinates between these coordinates so W plus minus Y and theta so these three coordinates are just related to all the coordinates but the polar angle the, the polar angle isn't changed. So if you're familiar with the ADS3 story, so these coordinates, W plus minus Y, they are a little bit to Kerr black holes, what the Poincaré coordinates are to the BTZ uh, black hole coordinates. So this is where they took this, their, their inspiration from. So it's like these coordinates would be, uh, well, the, the natural coordinates of a CFT on the plane, while the Kerr or the black hole coordinates would be, um, well, if you want the coordinates of a field theory on a, on a cylinder, on a thermal cylinder, 
OK, here. Parenthesis closed. Um, so they devise these vector fields. OK, you are free to do what, what, what you want in, in life. And so they just picked these, uh, these vector fields. And what they did, so they, did, they didn't really work out boundary conditions preserved by these vector fields or anything. They just took these vector fields and computed the central extensions. So there is something like, a bit magical, but central extensions is that they should be the same. They should be central. So they should be the same over the whole, so they should be central, but they should be the same over the whole phase space. So in particular, you can compute to do the precise computation. You can evaluate them, them on one given metric of your phase space. So they just evaluated the central extensions of these vector fields on just the near horizon geometry of Kerr. What they found is that the, the, the central charge is given by 12. And using these value of the central extensions, they were able to, uh, again, reproduce the entropy. But no, the entropy of generic Kerr using a Cardi formula. And in, so that's a good question. So no, um, I, I, I agree that this is a bit more confusing. So that you, ha you don't have any anyway. And as far as I know, of course, the first thing that people have tried to do when that paper was out is just, OK, take the metric and act with these guys on them and generate boundary conditions. And as far as I know, no one has succeeded to do this. So, OK. So this is why I said it's, like, it's, more, it's more controversial, because we don't, there, there's no boundary conditions that have these guys are as symmetry. So just to understand, these vector fields uh, are just like, why do they take them like this? I mean, they obey the conformal algebra. That that, they obey the conformal algebra, and that's it. They so so you, you see, right? So the, if you look at the relation between this w plus minus and y and the, the Kerr coordinate, you have this exponential mapping, which sort of like reminiscent for what, what you would have between Poincaré and BTZ, and but these conformal coordinates, and these are by the way also the coordinates that appear here naturally in the in the in, in the hidden conformal symmetry. So, but clearly it's not really understood why these these coordinates stand out. It's just the You mean this? So these are the vector fields. Yes. And you want to know the charge. Yeah, so. That right, so, um, you know, you just have the fact that you have this Q of xi, it's just the integral of some on an on, 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 on n minus 2 sphere of this uh, conserved n minus 2 form, which you can construct. There are some ambiguities in constructing this thing too when you have boundary terms and. And they are so, and they are integrable, and they are conserved. Yes, and they have to like they have to play with some ambiguities here in K. There is this thing about the wall zoo pass term that they have to add to make charges integrable, and and of course it, it is not clear. So they make one choice to render charges integrable, and that gives this thing. But it's not clear that it's the only choice. And actually, they have been like following follow-up follow work where they try to to well to fix this unambiguously, and in general, they find a different central charge. I mean, you can see that different boundary terms will actually contribute, contribute to, the, to, to the central charge, and that can disrupt this, 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 this curse CFT value. So this is why I was saying that this is more, like, more speculative. And we, we don't quite understand why this works. It's more, so, but there is a numerological uh, uh, agreement there. And that's, I think, all there is. Um, so the horizons are uh, w plus is 0 and w minus is 0. So actually, 1 is, is defined on the past horizon, and 1 is defined on the, on the future horizon. And there is a, this is, the interesting thing, too, is that if you, when you compute c plus minus, you will see that c plus will only have contributions from the past horizon, and c minus will only have contributions from the future horizon, which is a bit, like, maybe tricky to understand because if you have a collapsing black hole, you, you won't have a, f a past horizon, for example. So, these, these charges are defined to any rate as well? Uh, I don't think so. No, they are really defined close to the bifurcation horizon, bifurcation surface. Okay. Yeah. So, can you differentiate between oh, okay. horizon and anything? 
I think they have nothing to say about null infinity here. They really zoom in close to the horizon. That's like about like a Rindler space. And everything is defined in that near region. I mean, these coordinates w plus minus aren't even well defined, I think. Or maybe they are. Um, they are especially defined in the near horizon region around, around, the, around the future and past horizon. Yeah. OK. OK, so far, so good. So there are some hints that actually, after all, conformal symmetry might. Um, Yes. What do you mean? So you mean Kerr as opposed to any other a higher dimensional black hole, or? This is in four. How many dimensions are there? That's it. That's in four dimensions, but like essentially everything applies to like much more general black holes with charges non-supersymmetric in higher dimensions. So Kerr CFT really goes through in. So that's not specific to four dimensions here. What I, what I said. Well, Kerr, this certainly not hidden conformal symmetries. I guess is exists for like any other like. Gen more general black hole, and this HHPS thing, I don't think this has been. But you said generic okay. care. So if I take a non rotating black hole, I get a zero centimeter. And that matches with the. Other so, ah, that's a good point. So I don't think, so it, it doesn't, well, so M equal, so J equals zero, that's a special thing, because here they really have this. I, I don't think this, so this cha change of coordinates between, I think, this and this breaks down when J equals zero. So that's, there, there is something special indeed about Schwarzschild. So that's right. So what you need is, 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 is well, for, for instance, a major difference between Schwarzschild and Kerr is that Kerr you have multiple horizons. Is that a feature that, that is play, plays a role in that game? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure, I don't know. Um, I don't know if you could, um, yeah, the, the point is that you wouldn't know which, so let's put it this way. So it is not clear which generator you should, you should take when j equals zero. So th what the point is that in their derivation is that you have to expand around the, the, ex the external curved black hole horizon. And it's not clear how to do the expansion when j equals zero. It's not clear how to pick these coordinates. It's not clear how to, how to do this computation, I think. So well, the case j equals zero, I, I, they, they don't say much about it. Well, they don't say anything about it. And I don't think this has been generalized to Troy Child. Or another option, which probably is very complicated, is you know, if you have a nut charge. Yeah, then uh, I don't know. This is the standard you know, setup of, uh, of solutions that you use. Yeah, so um, I would say that with solutions with nut charges, so it, well, actually, I don't know. I don't know if you uh, looked at. I'm not sure. OK, so 2D conformal symmetry um, could be useful to describe like black holes beyond ADS3 black holes or near ADS3 near horizon geometries, uh, geometries but well, but the question is that, is there all there is? I mean, of course, we know that 2D conformal symmetry certainly is not the only interesting symmetry appearing in nature in general and in gravity theories in particular. Of course, if you consider any other space than ADS3, well, in general, the symmetries that you will find will be actually different from the 2D conformal group. If you consider um, you know, ADSD for D different from 3, and you look at the asymptotic symmetries, well, what you will find in four dimensions, for example, you will find SO2, 3 as asymptotic symmetry group. You might find, well, infinite dimensional extensions like the lambda BMS4 group. There, there's different things you will find, but they're not going to be related to the 2D conformal group. If you're interested in ADS2, well, then it's more, even more tricky. There have been like a lot of work on understanding ADS2, and I will say a word about it in a couple, in a couple minutes. And again, it's going to be different from the two copies of Virazo algebra. Actually, as Mark was mentioning, even in ADS3, well, there, there is different boundary conditions from the Brown and boundary conditions that have symmetries that are different from Virazoro plus Virazoro. And these have started to appear in the last 10 years. Actually, instead of, so 
So Braun and O would have Vira Zoro plus Vira Zoro, but there are actually different types. So given ADS3 and BTZ black holes, there's different types of boundary conditions and fall-offs that you can put at infinity that will have like a plethora of different symmetry algebras that depart from Vira Zoro plus Vira Zoro. So for example, you can find uh, Vira Zoro plus a U1, a U1 affine algebra. You can find two affine algebras, two U1s. You can find uh, Vira Zoro plus U1 squared. You can even find SL2R current algebras plus U1. You can find two, co two copies of, of, an, of an affine current algebra. So this, this was done by Compare, Song, and Strominger. This was done in, in our work on like soft Heisenberg charges um, with, var with, with various people. So there was a paper in 2016. So this is boundary conditions that Troussard found. This is uh, boundary conditions by, uh, by Avery and collaborators. And then uh, Grumiller and, and Riegler uh, found what they call the most general boundary conditions in ADS3. And they found this SL2R plus SL2R current algebra from which they claim they can construct, well, they can deduce actually all the others. For example, if you take an SL2R current algebra, you'll be able to, to construct a Vira Zoro algebra out of it by Sugawa construction, for example. But just to tell you that there are many, many different symmetries that you can find even in the context of ADS3 gravity. Well, of course, uh, you, don't need to be, you don't need to be in ADS. After all, uh, lambda negative is a really speci very special thing to study. You could, you could just study, for example, that space in D dimensions. In that case, uh, the symmetries you will find would be the BMS group. And this is a really interesting like, symmetry structure that has relation to Corollian uh, conformal field theories. And Arjun has been working on this. Um, we have been working on this. And so that's also a really interesting um, like symmetry algebra that there's lots to, lots to do with. You can focus, for example, on near horizon geometries. So near horizon geometries, they include the neck geometry that I mentioned, but they also include Rindler spaces. Um, and if you, if you, if you want to work out the boundary conditions uh, for near horizon geometry, again, you will find in, in general symmetries that are really different from the, the 2D conformal symmetry. And there's, of, of course, many more. There is the sitter. There is non-relativistic background. So there, there's, there's, well, there's, there, there are many different symmetries that you might be interested in. In. But actually, what, what I will do now, and so all these things, so all these setups are potentially the, the source and the basis for uh, non-ADS3, non-CFT2 holographic scenarios. But so what, what I will do now is actually focus on one of the corners of these non-ADS3, non-CFT2 uh, potential holographic scenarios, and um, the one Consider, and so this will lead us to the next, uh, let me go, to the next section of this talk. So away from conformal symmetry. I will focus on something that is called warped ADS3 spaces. And this will lead us to what is called warped, warped conformal field theory. So um, the motivation to study these spaces actually originates, so to, to, I, I will explain in a second what, what are the war these warped ADS3 spaces, but the original motivation comes from uh, actually cursing. So if you look at the neck geometry, so the geometry that arises as a near horizon limit of an extreme Kerr black hole, so the neck geometry looks like this. If you have two jg omega, so a function of theta, um, and you have minus So here, RT and phi are not the original Kerr co 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 coordinates, sorry, so they are 
so they, so, sorry, it's RDT. So they are uh, near horizon coordinates. Um, so T and R are near horizon coordinates, and phi two theta is the polar angle. So this is the polar angle, and phi uh, is the azimuthal angle. And so lambda is a function of theta, and so some function of theta, and omega is a function of theta. So uh, r equals zero. Yes, yes. So yes. So no. Let, let's focus on constant uh, constant theta slices. Uh, no, lambda is a function of theta, sorry. It's some, yeah, some function of, of the polar angle. Now, if you focus on constant theta slices, what you will find is that for lambda equals to 1, the three-dimensional metric is just ADS3. Actually, it's a quotient of ADS3. It's a self-dual quotient of ADS3. But that's, that metric is just locally ADS3. And in that case, well, you would expect that something like an analysis a la Braun and O would yield you a two-dimensional CFT and so, just give a, uh, so justify curse CFT in a way. But what happens is that when lambda is not different, is, is, sorry, is, is not equal to 1, then um, the metric you have is no longer locally ADS3. The metric you're getting is a space that is called warped ADS3. So this warped ADS3 metric, what is it? It's actually a metric that you obtain by just taking ADS3, and you pick some killing vector of ADS3. So, A, so, so, uh, so chi belongs to an SL2R, say, left of the isometry group of ADS3 that's including in SL2 left plus SL2 right, which is the isometric group of ADS3. So the isometric group of ADS3 is SO2, 2, which is SL2 left plus SL2 right. You just pick one in one of the SL2s. And you, you, construct, the you construct the following metric. So H is some number. And you deform the metric by an object like this. So the warped ADS3 metric, you just take ADS3 and deform it by, uh, by this bilinear of killing vector. OK, so warped ADS3, so this construction tells you that the isometries of warped ADS3 are just SL2R times U1. And um, there is a crucial feature about this space, crucial feature, is that warped so the warped ADS3 spaces, they, knew, they do not belong to Brown and O boundary conditions. They do not satisfy the Brown and O boundary conditions. So you could, you could say, well, uh, maybe these spaces are the formation of ADS3, but that does not affect the asymptotic behavior. But it's not the case. Turning on this deformation shows you that you, you, you don't have, sorry for crossing you out, but uh, uh, that these, these spaces uh, do not belong to the phase space of the Brown and O boundary conditions. So they have overleading components of the metric. Okay. Solution of the equation. No, as such, warped ADS3 spaces, as such, they are not. So, of course, this is solution to Einstein's equations, but if you just restrict to, th to the three-dimensional metric, it does not. But you can embed it in, as you know, in like hi higher, higher curvature theories. And how you choose H? So H is just a, well, so that's just the, so that's just the definition. So in that case, H would be something like lambda squared minus lambda minus one. But in, so, so that's the general definition of warped ADS3 spaces. Take ADS3, pick some number, and in general, this H will be fixed by the equations of motion, if you want. If you embed this in TMG, for example, well, then the number, that number will be fixed by the TMG coupling and, and the ADS length. So it is a solution of something. Yeah, it's a solution of plenty of things, but it's just not, not, G, not just GR with cosmological constant. Yes. OK. So I need to mention that these warped ADS3 spaces actually have appeared um, actually in many places before, before Kerr CFT. Um,
So they have appeared in an early paper uh, by Roman and Spandel that were studying like girdle spaces. Girdle spaces actually are an instance of, of warped eddies three black holes. They have appeared also in the, concept, in, the concept, in the context of string theory. Actually, it was shown in a paper by uh, Israel, Kunas, Petropoulos, and uh, Orlando that warped EDS3 spaces can be obtained as exact string theory backgrounds. You just take an SL2R with the Mina Witten model, you just turn marginal deformation on, on that model, and if you just like pick the right deformation, you will end up with a, with a, with a warped EDS3 space. And what in, what, what she, which is interesting actually because in their paper, they were also interested in ADS2 holography, and there's one limit of this deformation that just gives you, that leads from, that, that takes you from ADS3 to actually ADS2 with, with warped ADS3 spaces in between. So that, that was an interesting thing. Um, you say pick up the right deformation, that means pick up the right function. The, the, the right H, yes. Yes. And actually, in their case, you will see that when h squared is one half, the metric actually decouples, and instead of a warped ADS3 space, which is a vibration, of over ADS2, well, actually the fiber trivializes, and you end up with ADS2 plus just like a trivial fiber, ADS2 times the line, essentially. Yes. And so they have been studied, they appear in string theory, and actually there are also black holes in warped ADS3. You can show that there are black holes that are asymptotically warped ADS3. Uh, this was shown by, in particular, by Clément. Um, Bagnados, Barnish, Comper, Gamberov, uh, etc., and and also Aninos et al. If you okay, there's lots of references. If you if you're interested, I I could give them later. So actually, my 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 my, my personal first encounter with warped ADS3 spaces that happened around. Um, so let let me mention this paper. So there there was this paper 05, 12, 105 by. Um, Bagnados, Comper, uh, Barnish, and Gomberov. So some, some, somewhere around 2006, I was, a, I was a grad student, and Geoffrey Comper was giving a, a talk about his work, about like strange black hole, black hole solutions that they had found in so three-dimensional black holes that they had found in a, in, in a three-dimensional theory. And so they had studied the thermodynamics of these black holes. These black holes actually happen to be warped, to, to be warped in these three black holes. So a question that naturally arose from this is, well, can we explain the entropy of these black holes? Uh, well, in the same way that Strominger sort of explained the entropy of BTZ black holes using the Brown and, o, the, the, the Brown and o symmetries. And, um, right, so, so, th so that, that was the question we, 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 we wondered about. And he said, okay, well, we have these black holes, can we explain, um, can we explain their entropy? So can we explain, can we write something like S Cardi is S three for these black holes? And of course, obviously, the, the first problem we, we ran into is that these black holes didn't satisfy the Brown and O boundary conditions. Okay, so the first thing we had to do is to write, is to, is to, was to find boundary conditions that included these black holes. And then we were trying to find two Virazoro algebras, and it didn't work out. As, man, as Mark mentioned, uh, finding boundary conditions is a bit of an art, and it's really hard to, to, like, to pair everything together. Everything has to be consistent in the end, but it's really hard to find something when you don't know what you are looking for, actually. So we are looking for two virazo algebra, and we didn't find them. And so one day we were talking to Mark, and we were saying, okay, we have, probably he doesn't remember, but, or maybe he does, but so we were looking into these black holes that have a cell to art and U1 isometry, and we don't find two virazo algebras. And he told us, well, maybe the U1 becomes an affine current algebra. Maybe the U1 becomes uh, um, yeah, an, an affine U1. And eventually this is what we found. So we found boundary conditions, including warped ADS3 black holes. And the symmetries of these boundary conditions, they were actually different from two copies of a Virazo algebra. And what we found was indeed a semi-direct product of a Virazo algebra and a U1 affine. So we were just founding this.
And right. So we found this symmetry algebra, but of course this doesn't help much because we didn't know what to do with that algebra in order to answer that question. And even more, a couple months, well, around that time, so, so Aninos and collaborators, they studied, they studied these black holes, and they found that the entropy was actually written like C left, T left, to C right, T right. Which is actually another form of the Cardi formula that I wrote earlier. So at that time, we were really confused because um, we had black holes, we found symmetries that weren't actually the full conformal symmetry, but on the other hand, people well, were claiming that the, black, the entropy of these black holes could be reproduced by a Virazo algebra. So how, 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 could it, how was this possible? So to, me, to make progress, what we did is we took at face the fact that these black holes belong to a phase space that, are, that have these symmetries, and we wondered, well, could it be that there exists a field theory whose symmetry algebra is that one and not that of, conf uh, of a 2D conformal algebra. So this led to the definition of a warped conformal field theory, warped CFT. So a warped CFT is just a 2D field theory that is invariant under f minus is a function of x minus, so that's, that will give you the conformal, uh, the Virazo conformal algebra. But then on the right hand side, well, you have x plus an arbitrary function of j minus. And actually, so this is what we did in, in, the, in this paper with, with, with Tommy and Diego, is that we worked out the properties of a field theory that had these this symmetries. It just happens, field theories with these symmetries have extremely interesting properties. In particular, they have a counterpart of modular invariance. But remember that the Cardi formula can be derived uh, using modular invariance by you know, projecting the, the, so taking the partition function, doing to the modular invariant channel, and, and projecting the partition function uh, uh, on the ground state in a high temperature uh, regime. So we have something similar for warp CFTs. So you have an analog. You have an analog of uh, the Cardi formula for warp CFT. Actually, um, Yes. How do you why, 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 why could this not, not be a one-dimensional one field theory which, which has just, just the, I mean, you, you, movers, if you wish? Uh, well, that thing doesn't have right movers, right? That, I mean, I mean look, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that uh, why, I mean, say, say think of this as, uh, I mean, you know, like, uh, I mean, like two copies of, 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 of the Verasoro, now, now, I mean, augmented by some new ones. Mm -hmm. and you just don't have this <laughs> second copy anymore, basically. I mean, why do you so that thing, from the algebraic point of view, this is not really different from a, a, a CFT with a current, with a Carroll CFT with a current. Yeah. It's exactly the same. Okay. Now, you have some special features here. For example, you have the fact that the level is negative. The level here is negative. There are some particular features that the vacuum state has an imaginary charge, for example. So you have a lot of like specific features that make this holographic warp CFTs sort of different, but I agree from the algebraic point of view is no, is no different from a Carroll CFT with a current. So I'm going to write for you. Well, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Well, don't spoil my uh, my punchline. But the thing is that this warp CFT formula. So actually, I realized that I'm really uh, doing really bad with time. No, no, uh, yeah, if you're relaxed this time, that's okay, but uh, I hope you're really relaxed. <laughs> okay. Um, so you can write, you can write the warp CFT, so I'm not gonna write so to win a little bit of time. But, so you can write the same way you could write the CFT formula in terms of L0 and L0 bar. You can write warp CFT entropy in terms of L0 and P0, right? So that's, so L0 and P0 are just the zero modes of these, 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 these objects here. Okay, I'm gonna write it because it's, it's, it's not. Okay. 
So that's the counterpart of the so the Cauli formula. You would find you would have you know C L zero over six plus the same thing. So that would be the CFT formula, and the warped CFT formula is actually this. So here in this formula, C minus C over twenty four is L zero vac. So the Cauli formula actually uh, depends on the vacuum values of uh, the vacuum values uh, the L the vacuum values of L zero. Um, for warped CFT, this is what you would get. And actually, if you compare this to the entropy of the warped ADS3 black holes, so th this was in a filtering in a bulk, well, they match, exactly. There is still one thing here that you will realize is that P, so there is an I here, that's one thing. What I need to tell you is K is negative. That means that generically, warped CFTs are non-unitary. And P0 vac is not determined by the symmetries. So in a warped CFT, so in a CFT, well, uh, unitarity and the fact that the unit operator is associated with the identity just fixes the fact that L0 of vac is minus 2 over 24. In warp CFTs, in a, so L0 of vac is fixed by the symmetries in a, in, a, in a bit the same way, but P0 of vac is not. So P0 of vac, you need to take input from the bulk to get it. But you can, you can compute it unambiguously, just take the black hole metrics. Generically, they have U1 times U1 isometry, and pick the value of P0 such that that is enhanced to SL2R times U1. And you will identify P0 of vac. P0 of vac is minus I over 6 for the, for the black hole metrics. Yes? May I ask you something? Do you have any free field realization of work CFTs, for example? So there are some examples of like free theories that have the word CFT symmetry. You have something like. Um, a Carroll, a Carroll massive fermion would, would be a warp CFT. I think there is also an example like of a free, of a free boson. There was, a, there was a, also a version of a BC system. So these kind of, there are a couple examples that exist, yes. But very few, I have to, I have to say. Yes. Okay, so this is, um, yes. These black holes are solutions of topologically massive. Yes, for example, yes. Then C would be related to L. To, to mu to mu and L, yes. Okay, and K is related to to, to mu to to the transamons coupling and the ADS yes, okay. ADS length, yes. And you can compute complete completely fixed, yes, okay. completely fixed, yes. Okay, <laughs> very good. Okay, so one more question. <laughs> so the shift in the L naught. Can I think of it as a Sure, exactly, okay. completely, yes. Actually, that's the, that's the spectral flow invariant combination, if you will. Yeah. Okay, but this is nice, but okay, we have this and there is a nice matching, so this is sort of like a hint that warp CFTs, after all, well, not after all, but warp CFTs indeed have something to tell uh, about, um, well, quantum systems with warp ADS3 boundary conditions. But still, there is, this, there is this thing. I mean, there is this thing that people found here. They found the Cardi formula. So why is it that this, that we found this from the symmetries and from a warped CFT perspective? And well, they seem to say that there is, there is a CFT description. Well, there is an, there is an explanation for this. So, so here, um, so instead of considering, like defining your warped CFT in terms of L0 and P0 charges, what you could do is consider a partition function that is a little bit different. Take a partition function that is this, minus beta left. Let me define a P0 tilde, minus beta right, L0 tilde. With P0 tilde is minus P0 squared over K, and L0 tilde is L0 minus P0 squared over K. You can define this. That's a partition function I can define. No, the, the point is that if you derive the Cardi formula in that new ensemble, the entropy in that ensemble, it would just look like this. I'm just going to take this. It's pi squared over 3. Then we have minus 24. Oops. So we have minus 24, L0 tail to vac, uh, t right. So t right is 1 over beta right, plus minus 24. P0 tilde vac, T left. So this is the warped CFT entropy degeneracy of state. 
that you will find in that what is called what we call the quadratic ensemble. Quadratic ensemble because here we have the, the charge that, that are squared. So, no, what's interesting is that so this in a CFT in a warp CFT this is what we call C. Okay, so this uh, well, this is this is what appears here. This is the C, and this is actually C right the C right that appeared in the, in the paper by Aninos and collaborators. So actually what you realize, and this, this quantity here, so P0 vac, we know what it is for the warped ADS3 black holes. We know what P0 tilde vac is. And actually numerically this coincides with C left, the C left that they found. So actually what happens is that a warped CFT in that particular ensemble has actually a degeneracy of states that looks exactly like a Cardi formula. And so this is, when they ruled the, the, the entropy, well, the entropy like this, actually what they were, well, what they were actually finding is that uh, the entropy is actually reproduced by a warped CFT, but in that quadratic ensemble. Okay, so you can write the entropy like this. It doesn't mean that you have a CFT. It just means that you, so, well, maybe you have, but we have never been able to find it. Actually, it just tells you that you have that algebra, and in that ensemble, the growth of states is given by this formula. Okay. So from this, I will, so we can, we can draw a first lesson. Is this an automorphism of the L? Well, actually, so here I just told you how to transform the zero modes, right? I just. So, yeah, so, right, so actually, what I wrote here, so to define these P tilde generators for the zero modes, you can, I mean, you, there, there is a not, there is a, there is a, you can generalize this to higher modes, ln tilde. And that's something like P0, Pn's, and some, like some stuff. So that's not an automorphism. So, we'll, so the algebra satisfied by the tilde is a little bit like this algebra. The only difference is that node level will become charge dependent. You will have P0 tilde appearing there. Okay. So from this, we draw our first lesson. So lesson number one. Um, so in certain regimes, and ensembles, so regimes, the Cardi regime, and ensembles, that particular quadratic ensemble, um, a warp CFT can disguise itself in a CFT. Okay, that's one thing. So now I want to come back to the, the hidden conformal symmetries. So remember that the hidden conformal symmetries were, was looking at the, the, the wave equation box phi equals zero, that we're finding that h plus h, h squared plus h bar squared uh, of phi, of, oh, sorry, for the radial equation is L, L plus one, R. So to do this, we had to neglect uh, a couple terms. We have to neglect terms of the form R, R omega times M omega. So, okay, we, so this was found in a regime where omega was much, much smaller than one over M, and R omega was much, much smaller than one. So to arrive at that equation, in the original radial equation, which is a Hohen equation, which is very complicated, you had to neglect, sorry, neglect terms of the form of, of this form. Now the point is that if you take a limit, so yeah, if you take a limit where um, you don't neglect this term, which means, so that, that was a long wavelength limit. So if you take a, a, a little bit less strict limit on the long wavelengths of the perturbations, and you include this term here, you will see that this equation will, transform, will, will become this.
sorry, h is zero bar. So in that limit, so a little bit stricter limit, you will find that perturbations will form representations not of the global conformal group, but of the global conf war warped conformal group. So H naught bar is one generator. So, it, it, so it's one. Um, it, it's a vector field. So A zero bar is a vector field that acts that in that that acts on Kerr. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, right. So that means that if you're working in this like long wavelength limit, but but you allow for 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 perturbations that are, that are not as strict at this limit. What you find is that uh, the, 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 hidden, well, the hidden conformal symmetry becomes a uh, hidden warped conformal, conformal symmetry. So lesson number two is, um, uh, what is lesson number two? So sometimes a warped CFT can refine a CFT result. Well, in the sense that here, if you allow for like less strict, um, a less strict regime on this long wavelengths, um, you you will find this is L two R. If you were to the then we don't know how to write them as as anything like a vector. Well, it, well, we we weren't able to write anything useful in that case. Which is sort of what you expect because you don't really expect that the full generic curve has. Any, well, maybe it has some symmetry, but we haven't been able to find it. And so for lesson number three, which uh, I, maybe I'm not going to write, is that remember what, what HHPS did. What HHPS did, they took in the near horizon of Kerr, they found two vector fields, like ln plus and ln minus, computed central extension and found Kerr. Well, of course, you can know, you can do the same thing with a warp CFT. You can cook up generators, so the, the lns will be the same as theirs. But you can find a PN that will also be defined in the future horizon now. So that it has the advantage now that you are not playing with something that's defined on the future horizon and past horizon. Both generators are defined on the future horizon. So you can define LN and PN. You can compute the central extensions. You will find C is 12J. And you will find a level that's minus 2J. Again, you can apply the warped Cardi formula with these values. And you will find that the, that the generic Kerr entropy is reproduced by a warp CFT formula. And again, it's not, it's, I mean, it's as, uh, it's the same level of rigor than the original HHPS, but just to show that the, their choice is just not unique. Warp CFT symmetries can also do the job. So lesson number three. Um, so what a CFT2 can achieve, a warp CFT can do. And maybe in a more natural way, because in that case, all the central extensions are, have contribution only from the future horizon, not from the past horizon. OK. So um, that, takes, <laughs> that takes me to the last part of the talk. So you told me that I have a little bit more, right? <laughs> so we have these three lessons, and OK. No, the, the, so the last part is our report, so uh, as I mentioned, on, on recent research. And the point is, um, oops, where's my five. So um, the question is, so we have warped CFTs and CFTs sometimes they sort of achieve the same thing, and it's really hard to distinguish between the two. So the question is, can we, can we find a regime where we could unambiguously discriminate between them? Okay. So the regime we, are, we will be working with is this uh, so-called near-extremal regime. Um, so discriminate.
Um, so discriminated. So the, uh, so work in some particular regime, work in near extremal regime, and in the bulk, this will correspond to focus on near extremal black holes. So near extremal black holes, they are. Um, so the, the subject of near extremal black holes is related to a subject that had like experienced like a lot of activity in recent year in, in recent years, which is the subject. Holography. Um, so I don't know if many of you are familiar with this nearly ADS2 holography and how JT gravity and the, Schwar and the Schwarzschild theory arises. Um, I had some kind of really long uh, recap of this here. So, um, okay, let, let, let me tell you a, a word about it. So the, 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 the problem is ADS2 holography. So, so ADS2 holography is a really re interesting uh, topic because like ADS2 spaces appear generically in the near horizon geometry of like a lot of different black holes. So we think that ADS2 like has a lot to tell about um, like quantum properties of black holes. Now the problem is that so ADS2 CFT1 is also the lowest occurrence of ADS CFT. So uh, people have been trying to understand it for, for quite some time, but it's, it's problematic because it is said that ADS2 doesn't have degrees of freedom. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The ADS2 doesn't well doesn't have degrees of freedom, of course, but doesn't does not admit finite energy excitations. So if you, if you try to put, take ADS2, put boundary conditions, you won't be able to to play like the AD, the, the Brown and O uh, game if you want, because either you have finite either you have finite energy excitations that destroy the asymptotic boundary of ADS2, or you don't. But then you're just left with ADS2 and the, and the theory is empty. So people have found a way to go around this, and this com comes under the name of nearly ADS2 holography. And so the solution is actually to break the conformal invariance of ADS2, and the way this, this, this conformal invariance is, is broken is actually governed by a mode, and the dynamics of this mode is governed by a really specific action, and that action is the Schwarzschild action. Um, so what's interesting is that that Schwarzschild action that actually controls physics near extremality, what's really interesting and perturbing and but fascinating is that that action becomes strongly coupled at low temperature. So if we go at really low temperature close to extremality, just considering the classical Schwarzschild action does not, is not enough. You need to consider the quantum mechanics of that mode to really understand physics near to extremality. So that's really complicated, but the good thing is that the Schwarzschild action can be computed exactly. Like it's one loop exact. You can, you can compute the full quantum partition function of the Schwarzschild theory. And so this is why you can, and this, this gives a handle uh, on near extremal um, physics. Um, So let me say a word on um, so nearly ADS2 holography. Um, actually, I'm, <laughs> I'm really. Uh, So if you start with a, okay, let me start with an example. So start with the reisner nostrum black hole with mass and, and charge Q. Um, Um, so the extremal black hole as R plus is R minus equals zero. And uh, you can define energy above extremality, which is defined by M minus Q. And this is equal zero for an, an extremal black hole. So in the near horizon geometry, the reisner nostrum black hole becomes ADS2 times S2. Okay, so DS squared is Q squared times 
minus dd squared plus dd squared. So at extremality, the Hawking temperature is zero, but the, but the Baconstein Hawking temperature is non-zero. So if you study, if you want to study the um, well, the behavior of Reisner and Ostrom close to extremality, you, you can see for for zero, so for small t, you will find that the energy, so the energy above extremality, goes like q cubed t squared. And the entropy goes like, so the, the extremal entropy plus some number going like t. So there was a puzzle that was raised in the 90s by, um, by Preskill et al. Is that when the energy above extremality is of the order of a Hawking quanta, of a single Hawking quanta, then the black hole doesn't have enough energy to emit a single quanta. And so it was thought that the, the, so the, the thermodynamic description should break down. Okay? So this, this happens when E goes like T, which is Q cubed T squared. That means that E is T, is 1 over Q cubed. And it, this is what, it, what is called the gap. So essentially, if you look at this, you have the energy above extremality, you have the temperature. So this is. E proportional to T. So the energy above extremality goes like this. And here we have this gap. So it was thought that below T, the thermodynamic description of black holes would break down. Actually, it happens is not the case. So th this puzzle was, was solved by Iliezu and Toriachi in a recent paper. And this is actually tied to, uh, to nearly ADS2 holography, how to, how to understand this. Um, well, I guess because you are, well, uh, the thermodynamic description requires that you have a lot of, a lot of Hawking photons, I guess, around. That's the thing. If you're not a even able, you cannot talk about temperature if you, are, if you only have one particle to emit or like a few particles to emit. Not, uh, and, and even if you have only one to emit, then you cannot even like, talk about like, an ensemble of particles. I think that's the thing. So I, it would break down even, even before that, even the gap. But it's around temperature around that, that scale, yes. So you no, know, the way we can, we can understand, um, you know, we, we can understand this, um, uh, these near extremal black holes is to reduce the theory to two dimensions, okay? So in the case of reisner nordstrom black hole, we have, a net, we have a spherical symmetry, and we can, we can reduce the theory to, do, to two dimensions. So in that case, the Einstein-Maxwell action in four dimensions will just reduce to, so if, if I just like use an NZ for dimensional reduction, which is this, and we have like phi squared, the omega squared, we use this ansatz and we'll end up with an action, a 2D action. It's this. So that's the, that's the kind of model that will put some potential for phi. OK? And then we could, we could just use that model to study like uh, from just like the strict ADS2 near horizon limit. But there is a problem, is that, as I mentioned, ADS2 does not admit finite energy excitations. So the equations of motion, so if you couple that action to matter, the equations of motion for the matter will just imply that the dilaton phi has to go like 1 over, uh, like one over z, z goes to, going to 0. That means that close to the boundary, you will have a huge back reaction that will just destroy the asymptotics of the space. So you have two choices. Either you put phi to zero, or, well, phi to a constant, and then you just have ADS2, or you take a non-constant phi that allows you to accept ADS2, but then you destroy the asymptotic boundary. So you cannot, you cannot play with ADS2 that way. So a solution that was found is um, 
So a way around this, oops, so a way around this, to look at nearly ADS2, so nearly ADS2 spaces. So essentially, you will take an ADS2 space, and you will not go all the way to the boundary, okay? So you, what you will do, is you will just specify a curve here. So some curve, T of U, D of U, where U is some parameter along the curve. Okay, what was shown by, so this, this was done by uh, Maldacena, Stanford, and Yang. What, what they did is that they fixed, some, they fixed some cutoff in the space. Okay, so you only consider your ADS2 space until this cutoff. And it's actually, what, what they showed is that it's actually possible to pick that cutoff in such a way that phi does not become too big as you, as you go, as you go to, that, to that boundary. So what happens is that, you know, you can set phi squared goes like phi zero plus phi, for some fixed value of phi zero that's gonna be the uh, related to the extremal entropy. And, um, and you, you, you choose the cutoffs such that phi of epsilon is some number, some small number. Okay, they show that it's possible to pick this. So when you do this and now plug this in this action, what they showed is that the action that you're getting is largely, largely universal for a wide variety of models, if you do this. And so what you're getting, the action you'll get. What is, sorry? For a variety? Oh yeah, for different, yeah. But yeah, you can have a different kinetic term here and for different potentials there, indeed, yes. yes. So then what you get, you do it. So this is where JT gravity appears. What you will get is some part here. It goes like this. Uh, you have one first part here, and then And right, so this is the boundary value of the dilaton. So here we have the we have this action corresponding to the extremal entropy. So this will correspond to the extremal entropy. And then here, so 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 this will this will control the extremal entropy, and this will control like departures from um, departures from the extremal entropy. So from uh, from from R zero, if you will. So this model is called JT gravity. and it will control uh, departures from extremality. So now the thing is that there are actually many ways the shape of this curve here. So you need to actually to put boundary conditions on how you, how you pick this curve, which in another way, which is telling you how you will um, glue the ADS2 region to the asymptotically flat region. So what they did, so what Maldesina, Stanford, and Yang did, is that they, they fixed the proper length of this curve. So they said the proper length of this curve is one over epsilon, and epsilon goes to zero. And they also fixed boundary conditions on the dilaton. So, so boundary conditions fix proper length. Plus, for the dilaton, they picked phi at the boundary. It's phi, it's phi b goes like some function of u over epsilon. So if you fix the proper length of this curve, well, no t of u and z of u will be related because you, you fix some condition on this. And so you will be left only with t of u. So t of u is actually the only degree of freedom you will be left with. So in principle, this t of u could be completely arbitrary. So if t of u is arbitrary, you can find that z of u is just epsilon of t prime of u. And you will just recover the conformal symmetry of ADS2 or the reparameterization symmetry 
of, of the boundary. But actually, because of the dilaton, because of this term here, this T of u will be constrained. It's not going to be like just an arbitrary function and, be, and, and the conformal symmetry, so the conformal symmetry of ADS2 will be broken because of this term here, because of the presence of the dilaton. Actually, so this K, this extrinsic, well, the, so the extrinsic curvature of the boundary, you can evaluate it for, for this curve. And what you will find here, that, that's, that's precisely the Schwarzschild action for T of u. So you will find that this is phi r, um, right, so the idea is there. So, actually, I didn't say anything about what this is. Um, okay, and now you can use actually this. You can use this formula to. You can use this part of the action to reproduce the near the near extremal entropy. So, so essentially, no. Z is ex ex exponential of minus i, so that i will be like the extremal part. It will give you the extremal, the extremal entropy. And this part of the action will give you the linear, the linear response of the entropy. Okay, so there is something. Okay, this thing, the, the effective coupling of this thing goes like t over e gap. So when t over e gap is order one, that thing becomes strongly coupled. And the problem is that so that's why when t is of the order of e gap is strongly coupled, and you need to understand the quantum mechanics of that thing. So the good thing is that uh, the um, so the partition function, so the partition function of the Schwarzschild can be computed exactly. It's one loop exact, and it's been computed by Stanford and Witten and by other people. And it goes like pi over beta to the three half exponential pi squared over beta. So in the last uh, minus three minutes of my talk, so this is a purely bulk computation. Here I have, I have been saying nothing about the dual theory, okay? But we believe that Z CFT or, the, well, okay, let me. Okay, so as I said, this was a bulk computation, but we believe that, uh, so for ADS CFT, we know that Z CFT is Z ADS, or more generally, do we have that we have, we believe that there's something like Z filter Z gravity. And we saw that here that the gravity partition function in the near horizon limit has a Schwarzschild sector. So the question, is it that the field theory, that, that field theory is dual to, to, to gravity theories with extremal black holes do have a Schwarzschild sector? So that's the question. And um, so I'll be, <laughs> that's uh, pretty crazy, okay. So how does it work for, for CFTs, this was done. Um, so do, so do two D CFTs have a Schwarzschild sector. So this was done by Gosh, Maxfield, and Toriachi in a paper in 2019. Um, so what is it that they, that they did? Um, so they, they considered, um, they considered a, par a CFT partition function. Okay, so, so the question is, can you find insufficiently generic CFTs with certain assumptions? For example, large central charge, for example, having a gap in the spectrum, a twist gap, for example, that the, the vacuum is the only state with H equal. So certain conditions, can you find uh, um, a regime in which the partition function collapses to the Schwarzschild partition function? Okay. And so for CFTs, the answer is yes. And what's really interesting is that the regime, this near extremal regime that they are considering, is really different from the Cardi regime. So for the Cardi regime, you would have beta left and beta right that are much, much smaller than, let's say, oh, that one. Okay? But here, 
well, you can the regime you can consider is so the regime you can consider is beta rights, say of the order of one over c, so near extremal regime. So beta rights is the order. So this is this is pretty small. So t right is pretty large. So that's the usual curly regime. So this means that. Um, Okay, so that, that's your usual carry, carry regime. But then you want to find the near, the near extremal regime. So to do this, you will take beta left of the order of C. So, okay, so here C is much, much bigger than one. So when beta left is much bigger than one, then, one over, then the temperature is, is really low. So T left goes to zero. And for BTZ black holes, T left goes like or minus minus or plus minus or minus, right? So we are really in the near extremal regime then. So this is the regime that they consider. OK, now what we need to do is can we, how, how can we, so in the, CF, in, in, the, in the Cardi regime, we can take the partition function and project it onto, onto some vacuum state using, uh, using these conditions. So the question, can we do the same thing using no these assumptions? And the answer is yes. You can take the partition function of a CFT in this regime, and it will take some form. Okay, I will just state the result because yeah, I, uh, um, I, don't, I don't want to hold you too much. But, so, but, but I'll just sketch the idea. So the partition function, you can just write it as a sum over characters. So in the usual CFT, you can write the partition function as a sum over characters. So it's something like this. And in a 2D CFT, you really know what these characters are. So the, the, the gen, you have a generic character, so that's just like no, no, no degenerate state, no, no null state. And one character is a little bit different. It's a vacuum character, because a vacuum character has one null state. It's L minus one, zero, L minus one, zero, that's a null state. So the character is slightly different. What you can show is that in these limits, so, okay, so that's, we, we have this, and we also have that the partition function is modular invariant. So you write the partition function like this, in this, uh, you use, a, you, you use a, the modular invariant transform channel. You use these two limits and the assumptions on the CFT of having a twist gap, for example, and then you will see that the partition function will take a really specific form, and the form that you will find for a CFT is the following. So now, of course, left and right sectors won't be symmetric anymore, right? Because on the right, you, you have a Cardi-like uh, Cardi -like behavior, but to the left, you will have something different. So, so, so what you, well, no, in a CFT, what you will, so, so Z of beta left and beta right goes like this. So you will get, for the right character, you will have like something simple, like something like this. Which is, which is actually what you would get in the Cardi regime. If you take this, you take 1 minus beta right, d beta right, log z, this will give you ct right. So that's the usual Cardi regime. But for the left character, because of this limit, what you will find is the following. Uh, and you have some other stuff and you have some prefactor here. So you will find this for a CFT. So this is precisely the Schwarzschild partition function. So now, if you compute the entropy, you will find that the entropy you derive from this is exactly the near extremal entropy that you will get for BDZ. OK, so that's the CFT result. So, so, uh, so the near extremal. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'm done. If I have six minutes, I can. <laughs> But people are really free to leave it. Uh, so so, so the, that means that the near extremal limit of a 2D CFT reproduces the near extremal thermo of BTZ. OK, so th this is the result. So what happens for a warp CFT? You can do exactly the same thing for a warp CFT. No, the point is that for warp CFT, the characters will be a little bit different. OK? And so the result you will get uh, for a warp CFT, blah, 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 blah. I'm skipping seven pages. And, uh, 
Uh, I, I got super excited about, I, I wanted to tell you about all these things. I, I know, I, I, I apologize. So, okay, for, for the warp CFT partition function that depends on tau and z, what you will find is this. So you have some prefactors, you have some, 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 some linear prefactors, some exponential here, some other exponential, but here, here comes the point. You will find two pi over theta squared so the, the partition function is just trace exponential minus beta a minus beta p0 plus i theta l0 over theta squared. Um, some number, so hvac, <laughs> exponential theta over 2. Okay. okay, so this is what you're getting. So one thing is that no, if you want to look, the study near extremo thermodynamics, if, if you compute the entropy of this, you will find that the entropy of this reproduces exactly the near extremal thermodynamics of warped ADS3 black holes. So that's a completely non-trivial check. So earlier we checked that in the Cardi regime, a warped CFT could reproduce the entropy of a warped black hole. Here we are checking a completely different regime. We are checking that in the near extremal limit of a warped CFT, we reproduce the near extremal thermodynamics of a warped ADS3 black hole, and that matches perfectly. So that's, again, that, that's another um, evidence that warped CFTs have something to say about warped ADS3 black holes. But now remember what the, goal, the original goal was. The original goal was to contrast CFTs and warped CFTs. And the point is that, are we getting a Schwarzschild here? So that's the partition function in, in Grand Canonical Ensemble. We are getting a Schwarzschild, but not quite. We have a factor of two here instead of the three half. So this factor of two, it can be traced back to the fact that the character of a warped CFT, it includes the contributions of the U1s. So you have to include the, the contribution of the, of the U1 descendants. So the tree comes from the tree generator of a cell 2R. The four, the four, half, four half comes from the, the four contributions of the tree cell 2R and the U1. And you're getting this. So the point is that how can we see this? Well, this will appear only in log contributions to the entropy. If we take log z to compute the entropy, this will appear like in logarithmic contributions. That means that if we, if we are able to pick up the logarithmic contributions to the entropy, then we might be able to discriminate between CFTs and, war, and, and warp CFTs, because it's only in this linear term here in the partition function that the difference manifests itself. So to summarize, um, I just like gave some arguments about the relevance of 2D conformal symmetry for like 3D black holes and higher dimensional black holes. Also mentioned that maybe other symmetries might be relevant, maybe these warped CFTs might be relevant. And I gave some arguments for this from entropy matching, from hidden conformal symmetries. And then we wanted to discriminate between the two and we wanted to do two things. Look at the near extremal regime and to see whether 2D CFTs have a near extremal regime that can account for near extremal physics of black holes, and this is a completely different, well, not completely, but this is a different regime from the Cardi regime. For CFTs, it matches. For warp CFTs, it, it matches too. So that's, well, evidence that CFTs have to do with ADS3, we already knew, but for warp CFTs, it was less obvious, and that's like more, that's, all, that's confirming this. Also, the goal to, to discriminate between warp CFTs and CFTs, we see here that if we look at this near extremal warp partition function, we have a prefactor here in Grand Canonical Ensemble that shows that the, it's not exactly a Schwarzschild. So, so theories with this factor of two have appeared. They, they are called the word Schwarzschild. And it might, it might be relevant, so it, I, have, I have not done this myself. So, but they might uh, transpire, I mean, they, they might appear at the level of the logarithmic corrections to the entropy. And it's not clear how to compute this. I, I have no real idea how to do this in practice. But this is where we might be looking for to discriminate between the two. And uh, thank you very much for your attention and sorry for it.